Beneath one of the calmest seas on Earth, something enormous is shifting. No explosions, no tremors, just the slow grinding of two colossal tectonic plates locked in a silent standoff beneath the South China Sea. For decades, scientists have watched the Manila Trench, a fault line stretching from Taiwan to the northern Philippines, as pressure builds with no release. Some call it the Pacific's ticking time bomb. But here's the unnerving part. The silence itself may be the warning. In nature, quiet faults are rarely safe ones. And this one sits just kilometers away from tens of millions of people. When it finally breaks, the ripple effect won't stop at the Philippines. It could send shockwaves across Asia, reshaping coastlines, cities, and economies in hours. How close are we to that moment? In this investigation, we'll uncover how the Manila Trench formed, why it's been silent for centuries, and what recent signs suggest that silence may be ending. Because when the ocean sleeps too long, it wakes violently. Picture the ocean floor like a vast scar, a thousand kilometers long, slicing between the Eurasian and Philippine sea plates. This is the Manila Trench, a boundary where one plate dives beneath the other. It's not a clean break, but a slow grinding collision. Every year, the sea floor is forced downward by about five centimeters, the width of your thumb. But that tiny movement carries the weight of continents. Normally, faults like this release tension through small quakes. The Manila Trench doesn't. It's been locked for centuries, holding more and more strain with nowhere to go. Beneath the surface, rock is bending like a loaded spring. Pressure rises, layer by layer, storing energy equivalent to thousands of nuclear bombs. And the deeper it locks, the larger the rupture it's capable of when it finally slips. Scientists call this kind of boundary a megathrust fault the same type responsible for the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami and Japan's 2011 Tohoku disaster. Except here, monitoring is scarce. There are no deep sea sensors, no warning buoys close enough to detect the first shock wave. If this trench moves suddenly, the world might learn about it only when the first wall of water hits the coast. But is there proof that this fault is truly locked, or could it already be shifting beneath our feet? In late 2024, a cluster of small earthquakes rippled across northern Luzon. To most people, they were forgettable tremors, the kind you sleep through. But to seismologists, they looked like a pattern waking up. Using GPS satellites, researchers detected the ground shifting by just a few millimeters, enough to suggest the Manila Trench is straining again. Then came something stranger, slow slip events, movements too gradual to feel, but identical to the ones that preceded Japan's 2011 disaster. These slips act like whispered warnings. They relieve pressure in tiny bursts while hinting that something deeper is stuck. The deeper the lock, the larger the break when it gives. Even the ocean itself has started to send subtle clues. Pressure sensors off Ilocos Sur have recorded minute changes in seafloor elevation, like the seabed breathing in and out. None of this guarantees a major quake, but taken together, it's a pattern scientists have seen before, always in the years leading up to catastrophe. And here's the chilling part. The last confirmed mega-rupture along this trench happened centuries ago, which means the stress that caused it has had centuries to reload. So if the trench is already shifting, the real question isn't if it will break, but whether we'll notice before it does. Imagine the trench like a bow pulled to its limit. The moment the string snaps, the first sound isn't thunder. It's the ocean floor jerking upward and downward in a single violent breath. In under a minute, a rupture races along the fault like a tearing zipper. Segments that have resisted for centuries finally slide. Rock rebounds. The seabed shifts by meters, pushing an invisible wall of water outward at jetliner speed. Close to the fault, the sea doesn't rise. It empties. Harbors draw down. Shorelines peel back. Boats keel over in the mud. That eerie low tide is the cue almost no one wants to recognize. The first wave is already inbound. On Luzon's west coast, the clock would be cruel. Minutes, not hours. Coastal towns get the first hit. Not the tallest wave, but often the most lethal because it arrives with no context. Streets turn into channels. Cars float, then pinball. Concrete erodes like sand. Farther out, the pulse travels the South China Sea in concentric rings, refracting around islands and shoals. Two hours later, a different coastline thinks it's safe, then sees the waterline bulge as if the horizon is lifting. And it wouldn't be just one wave. The second or third could be larger, depending on how the rupture segments step down the trench. Between sets, the water drags debris seaward, then hurls it back inland, a deadly conveyor. Power goes first, 
Comms follow. Maps and drone shots won't match the ground reality because the coastline itself has changed by meters. But the most important variable isn't height. It's time. How much warning do the near shorelines actually get? And who's listening when the ocean whispers instead of roars? Within minutes, disaster stops being geological. It becomes human. On Luzon's western coast, more than 8 million people live inside the first impact zone. Streets fill with noise before the first wave even hits. Car alarms, dogs, confused shouts. Then comes the sound no one can place. The ocean withdrawing. Fishermen sprint toward boats that are suddenly stranded on mud. Children point at fish, flopping where water used to be. By the time realization spreads, the water is already returning. Ten-meter walls of debris-filled sea strike with the force of concrete. Wooden homes dissolve in seconds. Concrete ones fracture from the pressure. Roads vanish beneath brown current. Power lines spark as transformers drown. Inland, people climb anything tall enough to see. Cell towers, roofs, overpasses, filming what they think is the final wave. But it isn't. A second surge follows minutes later, higher, faster, dragging cars and bodies back toward the coast. Emergency radios crackle, then fall silent. Evacuation maps prove useless as landmarks disappear. Helicopters can't lift off through the storm of debris. For survivors, the next hour is the longest of their lives, trapped between floodwater and darkness, waiting for daylight to show what's left. And beyond them, far across the South China Sea, that same wall of water is still moving carrying the disaster toward coastlines that haven't yet realized their clock is ticking. As the first wave leaves the Philippines behind, it doesn't weaken, it reorganizes. Over deep water, the tsunami travels faster than a jet, racing toward southern China, Vietnam, and Malaysia. By the time it nears land, satellites have detected its shape, but communication lines are already jammed. In Hong Kong, harbors drain without warning. Cargo ships scrape bottom as alarms echo through Victoria Harbor. Macau's casinos, built on reclaimed ground, see the tide vanish, then return like a freight train. Within minutes, streets become canals of shattered glass and neon reflections. Across the coastline of Vietnam, fishing villages face waves five meters high. Concrete seawalls hold for one hit, then crumble under the second. Offshore rigs shut down. Oil slicks ignite on the water. Southern China's industrial belt, the engine of regional trade, grinds to a halt. Container ports flood power stations fail. The same supply lines that move half of Asia's electronics now move wreckage instead. Financial markets freeze as footage floods global news. Traders watch real-time satellite loops showing the sea itself rearranging continents. And while the shock reaches every screen on Earth, another reality unfolds beneath the surface. The trench is still moving. Seismographs show aftershocks rippling along hundreds of kilometers. Each jolt redistributes pressure farther north toward Taiwan. Scientists warn the initial rupture may only be part of a chain. One fault slips, others follow. For the first time, the entire Western Pacific faces the possibility of cascading megathrusts, disasters that don't happen once, but in sequence. The question no one can yet answer, where does the chain stop? In the hours after the waves fade, satellites reveal an altered coastline. Parts of Western Luzon have risen by two meters, others have sunk below sea level entirely. The map no longer matches the land. Search teams from Japan, Australia, and the United States scramble into the region, navigating waters still thick with fuel and debris. The air smells of salt, oil, and burning plastic. Every landing zone doubles as a triage site. Across Asia, governments declare simultaneous states of emergency. Relief ships cross paths with naval fleets, blurring the line between aid and defense. Economies stumble as major ports from Manila to Shenzhen remain underwater. Shipping routes close, stock markets plunge. For the first time in modern history, the South China Sea becomes a humanitarian corridor instead of a trade hub. Yet, amid the chaos, the world sees rare cooperation. Scientists from rival nations share real-time seismic data, mapping aftershocks minute by minute. Engineers rebuild communications through temporary satellite constellations. The tragedy forces an uncomfortable truth. Every nation on this sea shares the same fault line and none can face it alone. But while cameras shift toward recovery, deep beneath the surface, instruments still register movement. The trench hasn't gone silent. It's adjusting, slowly, like a wound trying to close. The question haunting scientists now isn't how much was lost, but whether this was the main event or just the first in a series. Months later, the headlines fade, 
but the ocean remembers. Coral reefs along Luzon now sit meters higher than before, new cliffs formed by seconds of violence. Beaches have shifted, GPS markers sit in the wrong places. The Manila Trench has quieted again. Ships pass overhead every day, their crews unaware that beneath them lies a wound still pulsing with energy, one that will build again, silently, until the cycle restarts. Because the Earth doesn't reset after disaster, it pauses, it reloads. What we call calm seas are only the intermission between acts. As the world rebuilds its cities, ports, and routines, the trench waits in absolute stillness, the same stillness that fooled us before. One day, the silence will break again. Until then, the question isn't if this will happen, but whether we'll be ready this time. Now I want to hear from you. If you lived along these coasts, would you stay or move inland knowing what's under the water? Drop your thoughts in the comments below. I read everyone.